Napoleon's great displeasure at his brother, Lucien's marriage was shortly afterwards provoked afresh by the union which Jerome Bonaparte, the youngest of his brothers, contracted in the United States. Jerome, who was at that time serving in the Navy as lieutenant, had, towards the end of 1803, married a Miss Eliza Patterson, daughter of a Baltimore merchant. He was 19 years old at the time. Napoleon, in his double capacity as sovereign and head of the family, forbade the transcription of the marriage deed onto the civil registry. Without having recourse to the law courts, he declared the marriage void on the ground that it had been carried out without his consent, without publication of the bans, and whilst the two parties were minors. He asked the ecclesiastical authorities to annul the marriage, but the Pope, who was already for certain reasons antagonistic to the emperor, taking the interests of a Protestant woman, refused to sever the religious bond which united her to a Roman Catholic. Recalled to France by the Emperor, Jerome Bonaparte only returned toward the end of April 1805. He had arrived at Lisbon on an American vessel, accompanied by his father-in-law and his wife, avoiding the vigilance of the English fleet. There he was forced to separate from them, and after a sad leave-taking, departed for Madrid. Mr. Patterson and his daughter immediately returned to America. Jerome executed to the satisfaction of Napoleon a number of missions with which, as commander and rear admiral, he was entrusted. He then left the Navy for the Army, a service which he had long had an inclination. In 1807, having a body of Bavarians and Württembergers under his orders, he went through a brilliant campaign in Silesia. One after the other, he reduced all the fortresses in a province which had been fortified by Frederick the Great. After the Peace of Tilsit, which by one of the clauses of the treaty raised him to the dignity of King of Westphalia, he married in August 1807 a Catherine, daughter of the King of Württemberg, a princess whose noble character and admiral conduct under adversity entitle her to a place in history and to the praises of all. This marriage having destroyed Madame Eliza Patterson's last hopes, she resigned herself to the annulment of the union, which she had contracted in 1803. She addressed herself in 1808 to General Thoreau, who was French ambassador to the United States, and declared to him that she yielded to circumstances which imposed a painful and humiliating sacrifice upon her, and that she placed her own lot and that of her son in the emperor's hands. Napoleon, who was at that time in Spain, replied that he would see Madame Patterson's son with pleasure, that he would take him under his protection if she would send him to France, that she could rely on his esteem and his desire to be friendly with her, that in refusing to acknowledge the marriage he had had to yield to political considerations, that he was moreover determined to assure her son's future in a way which would meet her wishes, but that the matter must be treated with prudence and without publicity. Lucien and Jerome Bonaparte had not been included in the terms of the Senatus Consultum referring to the hereditary dignity of the imperial family because of the marriage which they contracted without the assent or contrary to the wishes of the head of the state. The reasons of this exclusion were well founded because it was not possible to separate Napoleon's authority as sovereign from his authority as head of his family. Numerous examples can be cited, if need be, to justify his claim to a right which he believed to be his. In our own days, the Duke of Sussex, son of King George III of England, having married Lady Murray at Rome, had his marriage annulled, although he had taken the precaution of having it celebrated for a second time after his return to England. His efforts remained without result, and the marriage was declared void because it had been effected without the consent of the English sovereign. The emperor went to visit Aix-la-Chapelle and stayed there eight days. The day after his arrival, he received the ambassadors and plenipotentiary ministers who handed him their new letters of credence and letters of congratulation from their courts on his accession to the empire. They were presented at his audience by Minister Talleyrand. Napoleon went to visit the manufactories of the town and of the little suburb called Borset, a small manufacturing settlement about three quarters of a mile from Aix-la-Chapelle. Examining all the manufacturers exhibited there and accepting invitations to all fets given his honor. 
He received in turn the departmental and municipal authorities, the judges, the military, and the clergy, and was present at the singing of a Te Deum, which was given in the ex-cathedral. The clergy showed him the relics of Charlemagne, who founded this church, and other relics which formerly had attracted pilgrims to Aix. These relics had been dispersed during the revolutionary period, but had been recovered by the church. On the eve of August 15th, his fete, his birthday, the emperor had taken advantage of his presence at Aix-la-Chapelle with the Empress Josephine, who had preceded him there to celebrate Charlemagne's fete with all the pomp of military, civil, and religious ceremonies. A pontifical mass was held in the cathedral in the presence of the empress with all her court. It was not to the saint of the legend that this homage was rendered, but to the founder of the Western Empire, of which Napoleon considered himself the restorer. Certain events, more private than public in character, took place during the new emperor's stay at Aix-la-Chapelle, about which I would like to say a few words. The indirect part played in the affair of the Duc d'Orient by General Calencourt can and had been taken the origin of the favor into which he had been taken. General Laura Stone on his side had been Napoleon's school fellow at the military school and had become one of his most distinguished. As he was one of his oldest aides de camp, various positions in the household of the first consul had been conferred upon him, notably the important post of master of the horse. General Laura Stone, Accordingly, thought that he had a claim to the post of Grand Equerry when the empire was founded and was accordingly hurt when this post was given to General Calencourt, his junior in service and his inferior in rank. He complained about the matter to the emperor and no doubt made use of expressions which offended Napoleon. For after a most stormy interview with the emperor at Aix-la-Chapelle, he received orders to start for Toulon to embark on the fleet under the command of Admiral Villeneuve and to take over the command of an army of seven or 8,000 men in transport. In the course of this expedition, General Lauriston, by a bold stroke, captured a fort in Dominica, the Diamond, which was a source of trouble to the trade and shipping of the island of Martinique. In the end, he was present at the fatal Battle of Trafalgar, after which he returned to Paris. A remembrance of the unpleasant scene which he had had with Napoleon at Aix-la-Chapelle seemed to have been effaced. The emperor appeared to have forgotten it, but General Lauriston's attitude in 1814 and since has shown that he at least remembered it. After his return from his maritime expedition, Lauriston resumed his service and was employed in the Grande Armée in important commands, which won for him later on under the restoration his nomination as Marshal of France. I was also, I think, at Aix-la-Chapelle, unless it were at Bologna, that the emperor caused Colonel Mouton, afterwards Comte de Lobau, to be presented to him. This officer was then commanding the 3rd Line Regiment. He had opposed Napoleon's elevation to the imperial dignity and had voted against this proposal. The emperor, satisfied with the discipline which Colonel Mouton maintained in his regiment and with his knowledge of tactics, was anxious to attach an officer of such merits to his person. He forgot his opposition and sent for him. The military tribune was converted after a short conversation. Napoleon made him his aide-de-camp and from thenceforward showed him a confidence which this officer justified by the services he rendered. Whilst the emperor was at Aix-la-Chapelle, a fact came to his knowledge, which disposed him very unfavorably towards Mr. de Talleyrand. A matter was in connection with certain territorial advantages, which Napoleon wished to bestow on the house of Nassau, in which he was interested. He had reserved to himself to settle this matter with the king of Prussia, with whom he was at that time on the best terms, when he learned that a negotiation followed up by the French ambassador at The Hague had been entered upon with a view to obtaining an indemnity of 12 millions from the Dutch government for the same consideration. The emperor wrote officially to the Minister of Foreign Affairs to complain that the Dutch government already greatly in arrears in carrying out its engagements for the equipment and armament of the flotilla and whose finances were involved should be thinking of presenting the Prince of Orange with a sum of money which was much too great for its resources. Napoleon then spoke in a confidential manner to the minister about the part which it was alleged to have been played in this matter by his ambassador. Monsieur de Talleyrand, however, pretended to be ignorant of it.
Monsieur de Simonville was accordingly ordered to Aix-la-Chapelle to meet the emperor and commanded to explain. Our agent at the Hague therefore produced the instructions which he had received from the minister of foreign affairs himself in the matter. The emperor was most indignant and spoke of nothing less than Monsieur de Talleyrand's dismissal. Armed with the documents which had been handed over to him, he awaited this minister who was to come and work with him. He had placed them in the drawer of a little table and gave me orders not to produce them until I was told to do so. I do not know what happened in the course of this interview, which had threatened to be a stormy one. But Monsieur de Talleyrand went away without the papers being asked for. I heard nothing more about the matter and noticed no apparent difference in the mutual relations of the sovereign and this minister. Doubtless, to make use of Napoleon's own expression, Talleyrand had been so adroitly evasive that after a long conversation, he had been able to make good his escape and avoid giving the explanations which the emperor had promised himself to hear from his lips. Such incidents, however, were so many blows struck in Napoleon's confidence in this minister. The emperor continued his journey by way of Cologne, Mayence, and Koblenz and returned to St. Cloud in the middle of October after an absence of three months. Numerous decrees were promulgated on his own initiative during his visit to the towns of Aix-la-Chapelle, Cologne, Bonn, Koblenz, Mayence, and other places on his route. Others were prompted by reports which he had asked in his various ministers and which these presented him on his return. These decrees are a proof of the attention with which Napoleon examined all petitions addressed to him and of the vivacity of conception with which at first sight he saw what improvements were to be made in the towns as well as in the rural districts and the works of embellishment which might with advantage be carried out in these places. The institution of decennial prizes dates from Aix-la-Chapelle. These prizes were to be distributed every 10 years on the proposal of a committee of the four classes of the Institute and were to be awarded to the authors of the best works in science, literature, painting, sculpture, and music, to the inventors of the most useful machines for the arts and manufacturers, and to the founders of the most advantageous establishments for the furtherance of national agriculture and industries. The disastrous events which occurred in 1814 at the time of the expiration of the first term of 10 years prevented this noble plan, which would have given a Salutary impulse to arts and letters for being carried into execution. The question of hereditary had been settled by the creation of the empire. Napoleon's nature was all that was great. The title of emperor being the highest title in modern Europe was the right appellation of the head of a nation, which was high above all other nations. This title being admitted the form of the courts of neighboring monarchies freed from privileges and purged of servility became a necessity of the new empire surrounded by ancient European states. If the new emperor of the French, the chief of a new race, the restorer of religion in France, the most powerful of Catholic sovereigns, stood in need of a religious consecration, he could only receive it at the head, from the head of the church and in the metropolis of the empire. The question of the intervention of the Holy Father and the consecration and coronation of the emperor became the subject of deliberations of the Council of State. Objections were raised in this assembly where the greatest liberty of discussion was allowed against a project which seemed likely to prompt the court of Rome to fresh pretensions. Napoleon's pressing arguments won the day, and Cardinal Fesch, French ambassador at Rome, was charged with the negotiation. After long turgiversations on the part of the Pope, and consultations with the most influential cardinals, whose opinions were now favorable, now hostile to the project. The proposals of the ambassador were accepted on conditions which were considered acceptable in Paris. Napoleon, hearing of the Pope's consent at Mayence, wrote him a dignified and measured letter begging him to come and give a religious character to the consecration and coronation of the first emperor of the French. This letter was carried by General Caffarelli, one of the emperor's aides de camp with an invitation to the Pope to come to Paris in the first days of November. Napoleon's letter, which made no allusion to settlement of religious questions, which were pending through the Pope into a fresh state of perplexity. At last, however, he made up his mind to leave Rome on November 2nd, the day after All Saints' Day. On the 25th, the emperor left the palace of Fontainebleau on the pretext of a hunt in the forest. Informed of the exact time at which the Pope would reach the cross of St. 
H. On the Paris road, the emperor arrived there at the same time. He alighted from his horse, and the pope descended from his carriage. The two embraced and then entered into the emperor's carriage, Napoleon going first and placing the pope in his right. The cardinals and the Holy Father suite entered the other carriages of the court. The procession made its way to the palace, where the two sovereigns were received by Cardinal Capera, the ministers, and the chief officers of the crown. After... Resting in his apartment, the Pope paid a visit to the Emperor and afterwards to the Empress. At four o'clock, Napoleon returned his visit and remained closeted with His Holiness for half an hour. Meanwhile, the ministers and other dignitaries had been presented to the Holy Father. On the morrow and on the following day, the Pope dined with the Emperor. Napoleon kept constantly giving him his hand. I heard Napoleon relate that in the course of one of their conversations, the Holy Father had pressed him to sign his name at the bottom of a document in which... Louis XIV, towards the end of his life, pressed by his confessor, had disavowed the articles of the Declaration of the Clergy of 1682, which is drawn up by Bossuet at the foundation of the liberties of the Gallican Church. The Pope promised to keep this act of complacence secret.